It's election night. You are running for the presidency of the United States and stand at the cusp of being the first nominee of your party to enter the White House in a quarter century. The vote is close. Not all of it is in, and there are some advisors telling you that the election could be stolen. What do you do? Well, go to sleep, I suppose. The rain was coming down pretty hard on the roof of the governor's mansion in Albany, New York, where Grover Cleveland sat with his closest aides, waiting to hear the outcome of various New York districts as to their choice in the 1884 presidential election. As it turns out, the governor's home state was the only one that mattered now. Cleveland had won that solid Democratic South of days ago, carried the old swing state of Indiana, as well as New Jersey and Connecticut. If he could get New York, the election was his. Losing New York, though, meant James Blaine, former speaker and a man of questionable ethics who many felt had lied about a bribery scandal involving a railroad years ago, would still win on the back of party loyalty. Enter the White House for the sixth Republican presidential victory in a row. And so a presidential election and probably a party's very presidential future came down to counting small wards in New York City. And the news coming in was confusing. There was no telegraph wire going into the governor's mansion, so telegrams had to be brought in by a messenger. At first, congratulatory telegrams came to the mansion, but it was realized soon that these were just based on optimistic newspaper reports with no real information from the voting ballots. No matter, there was a telephone in the mansion, an early contraption. That went out in a deluge of rain. So the news is slow, but an odd picture is emerging. It's a wacky election. Cleveland, the Democrat, had his best support coming from Republicans, independent Republicans, the so-called mugwumps, who had bolted the party, Carl Schultz, Ward Beecher, Putnam, men who had helped to begin the Republican Party, but were angered now at the corruption that was present to the GOP and wanted a strong civil service reform platform. They told Democratic leaders, elect someone like Grover Cleveland, we'll support you. Democratic Party responded. Yet in backing the reformed governor of New York, a former mayor of Buffalo who had wrestled with downstate city bosses, the Democratic Party had angered Tammany Hall. And this was the political machine that controlled the Irish vote in the city. So now, when Cleveland hears that he won Murray Hill, a swanky Republican area in the east side of New York, normally the Democrats would lose, his friends knew not to celebrate. Wait till you hear from the slums. The heavily Irish first and fourth wards gave Blaine majorities in districts that would have in the past raised the banner and struck the ban for any Democratic candidates, even the bad ones. Maybe they felt they would finally back a winner. It had been tiring waiting 25 years. Since Lincoln's election, the Democrats made some mistakes, nominating one man, another governor of New York, who begged the convention not to nominate him, nominating old newspaper editor Horace Greeley, who died right after the election, after an anemic campaign twice with McClellan and Hancock nominating Union generals to bolster the Democratic Party's military image, countercharges of their lack of patriotism, of the waving of the bloody shirt. Neither candidate was successful. All lost, and then that election of 1876, Democrats felt was stolen from them. It all added up to many years without the patronage power that came from Pennsylvania Avenue. Now it looked like things could change, but friends were warning Cleveland of possible fraud in tiny rural counties and sending telegrams out to Democrats and mugwump Republicans in these counties to go to the county clerk office and not leave without a certified copy, which they would then telegram to the governor's mansion. Cleveland, however, seemed more interested in supper than in returns. He had written to a friend a few days ago that, I cannot look upon the prospect of success with any joy. I do not fret. Perhaps I feel that I am not anxious enough. Around midnight, Grover Cleveland looked at his advisor who gathered around the table, counting up returns, waiting for soggy telegrams to arrive like some modern-day war room, said he was going to bed. I advise you to do the same, he said. Otherwise, you'll be counting me out. Grover was right not to pull an all-nighter. It would take a few days, and during that time, newspapers varied in calling the election for Cleveland or calling it for Blaine. Cleveland, in the end, carried New York by 1,200 votes. The election crossed the country by just 25,000, out of 10 million votes cast. It's a close one. I suppose I may address you as president-elect, Cleveland told a friend. I can see no pleasure in it, no satisfaction. Something odd happens with a Democrat who wins only as the result of Republican fracturing, not only the mugwump faction, but there is also a boss in upstate New York, Roscoe Conkling, who didn't like Blaine very much and whose district 
didn't do that well for Blaine. So Cleveland got into the White House as his party was losing seats in the House of Representatives. They lost 24 total in the 1884 congressional elections. Cleveland wore a coat and a top hat to his inauguration, but the coat had no tails. It kind of showed it, too. Even before he took office, a hard-money bill that he supported was rejected by congressional Democrats. In his term, he'd struggle with tariff reform, and that had been his central goal. This does happen. Presidential elections and congressional elections can have different results. Woodrow Wilson was re-elected president in 1916, but the party lost 12 seats in the House. Didn't lose control of the House, but lost 12 votes. Bill Clinton was elected in 1992 with a loss of nine votes in the House, even though his party still controlled. Carter was elected with an anemic gain of just one seat. Not so much with the coattails. More like a presidential windbreaker. Nothing to grab onto. There's no guarantee of coattails in elections. In Cleveland's time, it was worse, because then there were still states that held separate congressional elections in September, October, before the presidential election. Though, it was still after the nominee of the party was no, just wasn't on the same ballot. So you could still say there was some coattail effect. Coattails are important now to discuss because we don't know if President Obama will make re-election or if he'll get elected in a very weak kind of a re-elect. I find a funny coalition of fatalistic Republicans and optimistic Democrats now who have already anointed him. A lot of history supports it, though. I mean, the incumbent who wants to run again, right, and can get his party to agree wins two-thirds of the time. And that holds up pretty much over history. It's not just a 19th century trend. It holds over history, two-thirds of the time. So the ones that go south, though, are the ones that are running for president when the economy is bad. So thanks a lot, history, but not so much, because we really can't be sure there. You know, Obama's got a bit of um, a problem with his Gallup approval numbers. He has a lot of trouble since 2010 keeping the Gallup approval number you know, do you approve of the job the president's doing higher than the disapprove number? Do you disapprove of the job the president's doing? The disapprove has been consistently higher since you know, 2010. And he rarely gets an approval higher than 46 or 47. It depends a little on the day. But congressional approval is low as well. James Tomlinson asks an interesting question on the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics to Facebook site. How many times in history has the old switcheroo occurred? By this, James means one party loses the White House, but the other party loses the House of Representatives, too. So the parties switch places. You know, if American voters are angry at the parties in both of the jobs, they say, well, you do this job then, you take the White House job, and you take the House of Representatives job, just switch places. How many times has that happened? Well, then you need to start with how many times did the White House change parties, right? It's held by one party, goes to a president of the other party. The first time was Jefferson, switching from Federalists to Jeffersonian Republicans, in 1800. The last time was 2008 with President Obama, and there's been 20 times in between there. 1828, 1840, 1844, 1848, 1852, 1860, 1884, 1888, 1892, 1896, 1912, 1920, 1932, 1952, 1960, 1968, 1976, 1980, 1992, 2000. 20 in between there, 22 total times American voters rejected the party that was in the White House. But they have never thrown the party out of the White House and then put that party into the House of Representatives if they were not already there. Gets a little dicier with the Senate because there you're talking about longer terms, six-year terms. Not every senator is up every two years and not every senator is up during a presidential election. It doesn't reflect changes in popular will at any given presidential election, the way the House of Representatives does every two years. And prior to the 20th century, they weren't elected uh, senators. So. so you don't have a situation where your party loses the White House and then down ticket, the party surges enough to storm the House of Representatives. Just doesn't happen. One of the closest is that 1884 election that I talked about, where some of the Republicans helped out the Democratic candidate and some of the Democratic candidate's own party didn't take much of a shine to him. But even in that year, Democrats lost seat, but still held on to the House, 182 to 149. So it takes a very big surge to win the House. Hard to do it when you're not winning up ticket. But just because it never happened 
Doesn't mean that it couldn't, I suppose. It would get quite interesting if it did, right? A Romney or a Gingrich in the White House, and now a Democratic House of Representatives instead of a Republican one, both of whom would think they earned a mandate. So cut taxes and expand the health care bill. Whose mandate is real? That would be the debate. The one branch would say, we're elected by the people who were voting for someone that was closest to them and their feelings. The president could argue, I'm elected by all the people. So it could happen, but the history on it indicates that it's a small chance. And also that despite the fact that there are two elections, presidential and congressional, there is some linkage between them when voters go to vote. They're not just picking candidates for two different jobs, even though sometimes they do. But in the aggregate, the greater trend is that it's a referendum on the current administration and a vote up or down on that referendum. At the same time, we can look at Democratic hopes of President Obama getting the House back. It seems a little tough as well. You know, you can do it. Uh, Truman did it actually with a very weak re-election. His party, his congressional party, outpolled him in, in votes all over the country. And as he barely beat Dewey, the Democrats got back the House. But Bill Clinton tried in 1996. He figured he would have an election victory over Bob Dole. Maybe they'd get the House back, and they did not. Reagan and Morning in America should have meant sunset for the Democratic Party in Congress, but not really. Even though Reagan won everything but Minnesota and the District of Columbia in 1984, Bernie only got 16 seats in the House and didn't even recover the losses from the 1982 midterms. Every president says, give me a Congress and I'll do dot, dot, dot. But American voters do what they want, regardless of what the president says, even when they're going to re-elect him. So it may just be that the president's a person in D.C. and Charlie Congressman is a guy that they can see at the town July 4th parade. There's some linkage between the two elections, but you know, not enough of a surge always to determine who's going to control Congress. What will it be this year? A long coat with tails for President Obama or a more modern presidential windbreaker? We'll certainly see. Well, the Sunshine State, Florida, has earned its place, it seems, now among the early primary states. And why not? Unlike Iowa or New Hampshire, you can't say that Florida isn't representative of the nation. It's got cows and beaches, cities, oranges, and Mickey Mouse. It's very populated. Uh, Legitimately, you can claim it as a southern state, but there's northerners who live there. It's a swing state. Democrats won in the 90s and in 2008, obviously came within a minuscule fraction of winning in 2000. Some say they won. It's diverse. It's big. So now you've got New Hampshire since 1952, Iowa since 1972, South Carolina since 1980. But these three states failed in this primary season. Iowa went to Santorum, but got his sleeves cut off in the other states. Romney won New Hampshire, but everybody expected that. And Gingrich stunned Romney in South Carolina, but that's been written off. Maybe that was just conservatives or the super PACs. Florida gives Romney an extra win against the others, more delegates. He's been able to slide right into the Nevada caucuses and win there. It's still a race out there, but Romney did himself a world of good, I think, with the Florida win, and so did Florida, right? Florida, I believe, will now take its place among the early primary state mix there. It's good in a way Iowa and New Hampshire get so much criticism for how come they get to pick the uh, presidential nominees, you know, and uh, this will probably lessen some of that. Samita Hudson writes, I have a question. How come the Democratic and Republican primaries are conducted at the same time when they obviously have different constituencies? And also, why isn't their regional primary, say the South and the Midwest, votes on the same day? Okay, this is obviously, you know, in response to the Rottenboro uh, podcast where I asked, how come Hawaii and Vermont get to pick the Republican candidate and how come Alabama's picking the Democratic candidate? And some of it goes back to that idea that I talked about that goes all the way at least to the 1860 convention. It was probably discussed even before, but we have the records of that where no one ever wants to give up on any kind of support, even if it's support from a state that's, you know, probably not going to happen in the general election. So Democrats love their folks in Jackson, Mississippi. Republicans in Burlington, Vermont don't want to limit their influence in deciding the party's nominee or doing anything that might anger them and push them to the other side or to a third party. 
Because if you do that, who's going to hold up the sign in the back of the Bernie Sanders rally, you know, calling him a socialist? Who's going to call, you know, Senator Roger Wicker, Mississippi's office, uh, asking him to support health care reform? You know, who's going to take those long shot political plays that every once in a while maybe will make it? I mean, there have been Democrats elected in Mississippi and there have been Republicans elected in uh, Vermont, uh, governors and uh, senators. That's part of it. You know, just don't want to anger the partisans. The other part to keep in mind is that states control primaries, not parties. The idea of this goes back to the progressive era, the 19-teens. The whole idea of primaries was to ensure fairness so that the state, and not a backroom group of bosses, would decide who nominees were. The state would ensure the fairness that the will of the voters, the voters within a particular party, would be heard fairly. When you say anything is controlled by the state, you mean the governor, the state legislatures. The state legislatures are happy to boost their state's pride and influence while they ensure the fairness of this vote, and possibly the economy too. All of those media dollars, all those people coming to the state. But they also care about the cost, elections cost. So it makes sense to have them on the same day. You're also boosting turnout. You only have to advertise one day that there's going to be voting. It's not exactly necessarily the same primary rules that occur in every state. You do have to look it up. Some states might only have a caucus for the Democrats or a primary for the Republicans. The Iowa caucus is conducted differently in the Democratic caucus as opposed to the Republican caucus. So you do have to look up state by state rules, but generally it is going to be on the same day. Uh, why don't you have these regional votes? You attempted to have this with Super Tuesday. So this is where all the southern states would vote at once and the south would be heard. Even there, though, you have some states that step away from that. So South Carolina decided it wanted to be first in the south and it stepped away from that. And other northern states are starting to move in on, starting to move in on Super Tuesday or even try to get uh, their state earlier. Even where a state decides to move something up, you have New Hampshire uh, with an automatic provision. The Secretary of State there is empowered to move the election to be first, whatever it takes. So the legislature doesn't even have to get involved in New Hampshire to ensure that uh, New Hampshire is the first in the nation. The parties are left to do no more than try to punish states for their various actions, or punish state parties. So Florida and Michigan in the 2008 election were punished by the Democratic Party for moving their uh, state's primaries up too soon. And actually, that could have cost Hillary Clinton the nomination. Now, we don't know because it's not exactly fair to say that those were her delegates because President Obama didn't compete in those states. But they were the type of states that Hillary Clinton was doing a little bit better than President Obama in that Democratic uh, nomination battle. So it's possible that uh, absent that punishment, she would have been the nominee. So states can punish and they can have real effects, as you see there. But that's all that they're left to do. They, the state parties do not run uh, these elections. South Carolina used to be run by the parties. Recently, South Carolina's primary was shifted to state control. So you can't control what states do, and states are going to move their primaries. This is actually the first year where I noticed California moved its primary back. So we are trying to get away, and I think it's a good thing, trying to get away from one national primary day where everybody goes to vote. Uh, you still want, to some extent, to have this race that goes on over time so that there's time to develop issues, ideas, to see the medal that a candidate really has and not just have, oh, who has the most money on one day and they can take the nomination of a party. Party gets some time to decide on its nominee, but increasingly, not that much time. We're seeing here, I mean, this, this thing could be uh, wrapped up. Now you have Nevada could be wrapped up. Gingrich, however, insists he's going to fight to the end all the way to the Tampa Convention, which I'm sure did not warm up the uh, hopes of uh, the party establishment much. I'm going to be doing a few more casts where I'm addressing some of the questions that people have posted on the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics Facebook site. The website is myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. There we have a link to the site. We also have a link to the archives for $14.99. You can purchase most of what we've recorded for the past uh, five years, or what I have, and uh, if you do like the program, please tell somebody about it. Plug on iTunes, uh, give us a like on Stitcher, uh, Google Plus One, us, <laughs> all of these things. Thank you for listening.